Um, welcome to uh, this meeting of the um, ISTT. Um, recording has started um, and uh, I should probably run through the accessibility protocol and I don't know if, if Sharon or Christy can add anything, but the main things are to um, keep your camera on when you're speaking and mute your microphone when you're not speaking. And that's basically to assist people who may be um, impaired with vi vision or, or hearing. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you for joining us on what is a very hot and sticky and stuffy evening um, and what has been right across the country, never mind the borough, some challenging times. There have been a number of incidents of fire and we see some of that um, unfolding on the national news as well. But it, it just highlights really how um, how important responding to the climate emergency is. So without further ado, um, I, I'm going to hand over to Sarah Cherry. Um, for the very first item, even before we go through the minutes of the previous meeting, because Sarah needs to leave by six o'clock. So we wanted to give her the maximum opportunity to address you. And she's going to talk to you about the Satan Camp um, Travel Demand Management Study. And I know many of you have got significant interest in this. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah. You're very welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shaw. Hello, everyone. So, yes, I'm Sarah Cherry. I'm from Mott McDonald and I'm leading this project um, we're calling the Satan Camp TDM study, um, which we've been commissioned to carry out by Cheshire West and Chester Council. Um, so I'm going to be using some slides, which hopefully will appear on the screen soon. Christy, are you OK to? I'm just share them? sharing them. Sorry, Sarah. Oh, brilliant. I'll mute myself thank now, you. but just tell me when to move on. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, so my um, uh, my background is in travel behaviour change, um, travel planning, travel demand management, and I'm project managing um, this this piece of work with a t with a team from from Mott McDonald. Um, so yeah, and also thank you for the invite to speak to the group today. So I'm just going to start by um, providing a little bit of background to the study, talk about what the aim of the work that we're doing is. I'll explain a little bit more about what we're actually doing what we've done to date, because um, the project is ongoing due to come to a close in the autumn. Um, I'll just recap on what our next steps are and then um, finish uh, with um, how you can help us as well. So first of all, then, um, I'm sure a lot of you are, are very aware, but um, there is an area wide travel plan in place as part of the Satan Camp development for Area B. And in this travel plan, there are a number of um, travel plan measures, uh, area wide travel plan measures that were identified. Um, things like real time passenger information, um, improvements to bus stops, um, improved signage and lighting for cycle routes, things like that. Um, and as part of that planning agreement, there was a section 106 agreement as well. Um, which um, facilitates funding for these measures. That was an agreement between the developer and the council. And the aim of this funding is to, uh, to improve transport and travel in, that st in the study area. And the map there just shows the red line um, study area as well. And the next slide shows it a little bit closer up so you can see it more clearly. Um, so just to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what we've been appointed to do. Um, so the council have asked us to help them to um, to prioritise those sustainable travel measures identified in the area wide travel plan. Um, so the way that we're, we're approaching this is firstly, um, we are wanting to get a full understanding of transport provision and travel behaviours in the local area. Um, as part of this, we're very keen to identify barriers, whether they're perceived or actual barriers to people using more sustainable modes. Um, we're also very interested in the short trips because short trips are more easily are easier to influence with travel demand management measures. So we're also uh, looking at the data to help us to identify um, congestion hotspots and particularly caused by by short trips. So we're using um, all of this information to help us to develop an evidence base um, to um, to develop a robust methodology to help the council to decide um, which sustainable travel measures to prioritise. So how are we actually doing this? 
well, to, to develop this evidence-based approach, um, we are carrying out a large amount of data collection as the first step. I've listed there all of the various things that we're doing. So the first thing we're doing is, um, or I should say we've done, um, is to um, do some more in-depth analysis of the trip data information from the from the traffic model. Um, so colleagues of mine um, that, that understand traffic modelling have been extracting data specifically relating to short um, short journeys. And we were also, thank you, provided with some work that was done by this group um, uh, to do something very similar. So we're also referring to that, which has been very useful. Um, we're also looking at um, road safety data that we've been provided with by the council. Uh, so colleagues have taken that data, sort of uh, we're, we're mapping it to identify road safety uh, sort of hotspots within that study area. Um, but we're also able to break that down by type of, of incident as well and whether cyclists and pedestrians are involved in those incidents as well. So, so we're looking at that in, in, in more depth. We've also requested uh, patronage data um, and reliability data from bus operators. Um, so we've received data from Stagecoach so far, and we've been looking at that just to just to get a better feel for for bus use, usage figures um, in the study area. Um, we also commissioned some uh, traffic counts. Uh, so we we commissioned some manual classified turning counts and automatic traffic counts as well. These were all carried out in the first week in July. So um, we worked with our subcontractor to identify, and with, of course, with, with Cheshire Western Chester Council to identify um, the, uh, the junctions that we were most interested in looking at um, across the study area. So we've looked at the traffic model um, and then in addition to that data, we've looked in more detail at more sort of localised junctions um, across the area. So we've got that data. Um, we haven't quite got to the stage where we've analysed it yet, um, but it's been received. So so that's that's with us now. Um, we've also been speaking to schools in the local area as well, contacted a number of schools um, and um, We've been asking for information if there's a school travel plan or if there's a school travel survey that's been carried out in the past. Um, but we've also asked schools if they could uh, carry out hands up surveys within the schools. So this gives a snapshot of um, of travel behaviour uh, by school pupils. Um, and on the next slide, I'll, I'll I'll tell you which schools we've we've got data for for that. Um, in addition to the to the traffic counts during that first week in July, um, we also carried out um, some snapshot bus passenger surveys at various points around the area. Um, so we had um, subcontractors who were out on site uh, approaching people waiting for buses um, at the bus interchange, outside the station, at the park and ride on Fourgate Street and also on the, at the Rake and Pickle uh, bus stop as well. So we had a very short questionnaire survey to find out more about people's um, uh, bus travelling behaviour, but also um, their thoughts on, on the, uh, the service and on the bus stop facilities. In addition to that, we carried out an area wide travel survey um, and thank you um, for uh, disseminating the information about that on our behalf. We got a good response rate to that, so we're really pleased. And again, this was to uh, to get probably yep, a snapshot as well of um, travel behaviour in the local area and to get um, get some more information um, about uh, people's journeys, but also um, whether people would consider changing the way that they travel as well. So all of all of that sort of data collection um, um, has has taken place. We're now at the point where we are analysing all of that data. Um, but we're also carrying out stakeholder engagement interviews. So this is to get a more in-depth um, understanding um, of the uh, sustainable trans transport in the local area, but also any issues um, and any suggestions about um, solutions or um, you know improvements that could be made. So we're now at the point where we've undertaken uh, two of those interviews and we're progressing well with organising uh, the remainder. So 
progress to date. So uh, for the school surveys, um, we did, you know, we have been in touch with a number of schools um, and we've got some good data back uh, from Chrysalton High and Bishop's Bluecoat School. Um, the two schools uh, were able to carry out hands up travel surveys for us. Uh, we got um, 27 classes at Chrysalton High and 250 students at Bluecoat uh, that were able to partic participate in that. We were also provided with the travel plan from Huntington primary school um, and also some historic data from Chrysalton High as well from a, a survey that took place last year. So we've got a good set of a good set of data um, about school travel in the local area. We've got 600 completed surveys to the uh, to the bus passenger survey um, and 900 responses to the area wide travel survey, which we were pleased with. So we're now at the stage where we're analysing the data um, and uh, getting that more in-depth information uh, by carrying out stakeholder engagement interviews. So we've had two interviews so far. We've spoken to Huntington and Great Borton Parish Councils and then we've got another meeting set up for next week with Chrysalton Parish Council. Um, and as I said this is to uh, to explore in more depth um, uh, sustainable travel in the local area what people feel on behalf of the residents um, are the main issues, um, what are the main barriers to people using sustainable travel, but then also um, we're exploring um, any uh, suggestions as to what improvements could be make as, made as well. Uh, we've we've devised uh, a structured sort of topic guide so that we're following the same um, interview with, with each of the stakeholders that we speak to, just to make sure that we cover everything with everybody. Um, so we're also um, trying to arrange um, a stakeholder engagement interview with National Highways. We've contacted um, the developers at Satan Camp as well. We've contacted Chester Business Park too. Um, haven't had any response yet, but um, hopefully those meetings will be arranged in the coming weeks. Um, there's also um, Roughton Parish Council as well that we've we've made contact with. It doesn't appear on that slide. Um, I've put business representative with a question mark um, and a representative of this task force with a question mark. So um, we would very much like to speak to um, a, a representative body uh, representing businesses in the in the local area. Um, we've been discussing with 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 Christy the best way of of going about that, um, and it would be it would be good if anyone has any particular suggestions as to as to who might be the best person to speak to or the best best organisation to speak to about that. Um, Karen, you had your hand up. Councillor Shaw, sorry. Sorry, yeah. Sarah, I could say say this at the end, but I was just going to say about the Cheshire West and Chester elected members for the affected areas as well. Um, one of them has been in touch with me about this and I, I passed your email on to him, but I think I think they would all welcome that as well, if especially if you're um, engaging with the parish councils. Yes, thank you. I'll make a note of that. Um, and yes, and I've also put um, representative of the task force on there as well. So, I mean, um, one of the things I was going to to ask um, of the group was we'd very much like to engage with you. There's not time today to have um, to, to receive any feedback on behalf of the task force. So what I was going to ask was um, if that somebody could be um, could be a representative of the task force, then I can be in touch uh, following this meeting to arrange to have uh, a, a full uh, one hour sort of engagement interview just to cover any any um, sort of any thoughts on on issues, um, but also suggestions as to what sorts of improvements could be made. So um, the next, yeah, so our next steps are to continue with the data analysis. Um, we're also um, going to be developing an assessment matrix to help with the process of prioritising the sustainable travel solutions. So we need a robust methodology and we want it uh, to be carried out as fairly as possible. And so this is the approach that we're going to take once we've analysed the data and once we've spoken to everybody, uh, all of the various local stakeholders. Um, what we'll do is we'll work through each of the of the measures um, and we'll 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 assess each of them um, to uh, to 
to assess how um, how likely each measure is to actually achieve the modal shift target um, from within the area wide travel plan, but also we'll be looking at other factors as well uh, to help us to come up with um, a prioritised list of, of TDM measures uh, to, to feedback to the council. And I know that um, uh, towards the end of our project in the autumn, there's a, a public consultation event that, that Christy is planning um, that we, we are due to support with as well. Thanks, Christy. So, yeah, so I just put the dates that we have available for, um, for a meeting with a representative of the task force, but probably best if we could arrange that after the, after the meeting today. So thank you very much. Um, and I see there's a hand up, but I can't see whose hand it is. I'm happy to take questions if anyone has any questions. Hi, oh, thanks, it's, uh, Catherine. It's Hello. Sorry, I was trying to get my camera off for some reason. Oh, OK, no camera. problem. Or on. Um, just wondering, is walking included as a mode of sustainable transport um, yes. when you're looking at this survey and just, you know, the barriers that people face to that? Um, yes, it is. Um, some of the measures from the area wide travel plan are to do with um, encouraging walking. Yes, and it, it is one of the modes that we ask people about. Okay, cool. It'd be interesting to know the findings. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, which group do you? Uh, so I, uh, Living Streets. Um, ah, I see, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Catherine. Um, Sarah, there's been a suggestion in the chat, um, just opening it now, that it might, as, as the ISTT consists of a diverse range of stakeholders, it might be better for a small group that rather than an individual representative. So I'm not sure how you feel about that, but maybe by small group, what do we mean? Three, four people, maybe? Yeah, that would work for me. Um, I mean, when we met with Great Borton, we had three or four councillors that attended that me that meeting um, and that worked quite well. So I'd be very happy with a small group, probably four maximum, I would suggest. OK, um, well, I don't know if there's any willing volunteers, but um, Christy, how do you want how do you want to do this? Should we should we say that they should contact yourself and myself? Um, yeah. and we can try and get that organised fairly quickly. Yeah, I'm happy to be the conduit for that. OK, that great. Helps. Yeah, okay. I think um, I think there was an ask as well, wasn't there, potentially from the bid as well. So I don't know whether that's the IST as a whole, including potentially Andy Farrell or somebody from the LEP, etc. But um, Put, put words into people's mouths but yeah we can resolve that yeah I think I think the bid the bids should be engaged separately because they they will have their a different perspective and um, it's important everybody uh, that we're inclusive and everybody gets the opportunity I think so okay so if you're interested in participating in the survey please let Christy know um, and we'll we'll aim for about a small group of three or four do we have any other questions for Sarah while she's here Apologies for the mispronunciation of uh, Christleton as well. <laughs> Can tell I'm not local. <laughs> Vanessa, did you want to come in? No, OK. That was a thumbs um, up from me. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> um, John Violet. John? Oh. Oh, good evening. Um, I'm John Violet and the Cycling UK representative. Um, last year, or two years ago now, um, in the main dual carriageway corridor of Borton, the council introduced the emergency active travel lane. Um, that's been suspended for quite a long time now, and I'm conscious that it forms part of the red line area, and it also formed a mini Holland bid, which um, that unfortunately didn't, didn't get acceptance by the Department of Transport, um, but it shows that Cheshire West Council feel that particular possibility of developing that for active travel is quite important. Um, the catchment area certainly is very, very large and it would encompass most of the area um, which you're considering. The, um, there was a group called the Sustainable Transport Task Force and they came up with um, some suggestions about how that could possibly be addressed in terms of uh, an active travel lane for cyclists. I don't know if you've got that information or. Yes, I have. Thank you. Oh, good. Right. John, okay. yes, that's actually been mentioned to me by uh, to us by um, by by a couple of people that we've spoken to. Um, somebody from the cycling campaign attended the um, the 
the stakeholder engagement interview on Monday, actually. I'm just looking through my notes to see if I can find his name. But yeah, yeah no, I've, got it, that's the main thing. Yeah, yeah, and we've been provided with a lot of the um, of the information and the studies that have been done previously as well. But thank you for that, John. Yeah, if I can just add to that, Sarah, I don't think um, any of us um, are complacent about that. We are currently working on um, we're currently working on options, I think it's fair to say. Um, uh, Christy, I don't know if you want to come in and comment, but um, I know that Rose is very keen to get a resolution on that and um, we're not just going to leave it permanently suspended without any intervention. So I hope that reassures people. Christy, do you want to come in? Um, only, only to say that, you know, fundamentally, at the, at the, well, not fundamentally, but at the heart of this is at, at the transport traffic demand management work is, is the, the corridor and, and the fact that we've had those sort of pausing of the active travel lanes as well. Uh, you know, obviously the A51 Borton corridor is transcending through the middle of the, um, through the corridor, through the red line area. Um, so we want to make sure that the work that we've commissioned with Sarah and her team is is giving us the evidence base in order to come up with the right solutions for that area and, and the, the area as a whole as well. So yeah, that ties in nicely with what you've just said, Councillor Shaw. OK, um, thanks very much. Uh, Stephen Perry. Oh, just quickly to say, uh, Sarah, it was me that uh, shared. Oh, oh, that. So apologies. <laughs> no, 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 don't apologise. Just just for everyone else's benefit. I did. I was invited by Peter Bulmer to join the uh, Borton Parish discussion on Monday and have subsequently offloaded lots of presentations to share, Sarah, that probably needs a bit of explanation. But, uh, you know, as I said in that email to you, Sarah, if you want any more help to talk it through and understand the context, but I think you probably have all the ideas we have, but it may not tell a story completely and logically. So I'm happy to help if you need it. Thank you, Stephen. OK, thanks very much. Um, do we have any other questions? OK, well, thank you, Sarah. Really appreciate your time and we'll let you uh, get on and do what you what you need to get on and do. Thanks so much for okay. spending the time with us this evening. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye bye. Thank Bye-bye. you. OK, so our next item is the minutes of the last meeting um, and they were sent out on the 1st of June, I believe, Sharon. Um, so I don't know if those we, we agreed to try and get them sent out as quickly as possible. So, uh, Vanessa, do you want to come in? Yeah, um, really great that they came out so promptly. That was brilliant because then at least we do get the time to read them properly whilst matters are still fresh in our mind. Um, apart from giving apologies for Mike tonight, I just wanted to um, take you to the, the minutes of the 17th of May. It says, apologies for Andy Farrell, Chester Bid. But then it says, Tony Barcroft, Crag. Now, I know Tony's on the on the call this evening, but Tony doesn't represent Crag. He represents King Street Residents Association. So I just wanted, I have, I have um, flagged it previously. But just to clarify that again. OK, and, thank you. Can we and can Mike's we, apologies. Right. OK, thank you. Um, can we make that amendment to the minutes then, Sharon? Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, OK, is everybody happy to accept them as a true and accurate record? John, you have your hand up. Oh, it's a tr- true and accurate record. No issue with that. Yeah. It's just a matter arising, really. OK, matters arising. John, over to you. Yeah. Um, I asked a question about the uh, Marriott Hotel development close to um, the railway station at the um, at the last meeting. And since then, I've actually answered my own question and I thought possibly we ought to uh, ju- just just tell you that um, there was concern that the Marriott Hotel planning permission uh, might have prevented the development of the LC Whit route from the railway station to Westminster Road. Um, in fact, what happened was that the Um, drawings were amended in September last year to include the um, a four meter wide um, gap for the cycleway to actually go through their land. So and and the drawings have been approved on that basis. So that's really good news. Thanks, John. I'm sorry if um, if we didn't get back to you on that, but thanks for noting it. OK, Nicola, do you want to come in, Nicola? Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, just to say, I think the, generally the minutes are great because it's a summary of the meeting, 
But what I find hard is not understanding what we what we agreed and what we said we'd do as a result of the meeting. So I think it'd be great if at the end of them they can summarise like what are the actual actions that we said we'd take for we take forward. So for example, I know one of them was um like uh Rose was liaising with Catherine on the Act to Travel Fest, you know, so just like just so we can kind of like then sort of assess and make sure that we're kind of progressing from meeting to meeting. So um, that'd be really great if we can we can do that and just kind of have a set of like agreed actions that we can focus in on. OK, that's a brilliant suggestion. Um, and we can ha I think we can highlight them on the minutes going forward um, and, we'll, and we'll action that. Thank you very much. Vanessa, did you want to come back in or was that a legacy hand? Legacy hand. Sorry, Karen. All right. OK, no problem. Um, Catherine? Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I just had a quick glance over the minutes there because apologies, I didn't read them fully last time, but it says uh, Living Streets could support as a partner with funding. We don't actually have funding. Um, that's something we partner with, you know, to deliver on the funding. So that just needs amending. OK, noted. Thank you. OK, um, can we move on then to the council update from Christy? Christy? Apologies. Um, I'm trying to load my presentation. Right. Hopefully you'll see this shortly when I. OK, thank you. Um, so a few things to update on on this time, really. So I'll start off with the um, e-scooter trial. Um, so I think I mentioned last time that DFT had been in touch and they were um, asking all the areas that had e-scooter trials to extend till November uh, 2022, which we were able to do so. Um, but they have written to us again um, and to all, again, all trial areas to suggest that um, they, they are looking at potentially introducing a new independent low speed zero emission vehicle category, um, which will provide regulations um, and potentially legalise e-scooters, whether that's for hire or a certain type, we don't know as yet. But they're also looking within that um, bracket, which I can't spell, say particularly well, low speed zero emission vehicle bracket, that they will also introduce um, pedal cycles, e-cycles and e-scooters be included within that rental permit scheme as well. Um, so as as I think I said last time that our um, vehicle special order license has been extended to the 30th of November um, and DFT have written to all areas within the trial to suggest that they would like um, areas participating in trials to continue with the trial um, until possibly the 31st of March 2024 um, and we need to notify DFT by the 31st of October with that information if we wish to do so. Um, so that's something the council is considering at this point in time. Um, so Christy, no. So, sorry to come back on this. Um, can I just query because it says the 31st of May 2024 in the presentation. Yeah. And in and in and in the previous iteration, I've seen a different date. So can we just clarify those dates? Yeah. OK, um, I've, I think I've drag and dropped this from a DFT email, so I may have provided the wrong date previously. So okay. I will I will clarify that. Um, could you make a note of that, Sharon? I'll make sure I amend this when the presentation goes out. Um, yeah. Sorry, and apologies. Um, and so uh, DFT are obviously looking to um, assess these trials. So they want us to continue with them so that we can add value to future schemes that are coming forward. Um, we can provide practical examples on how better to regulate the, the market, as it were, and encourage responsible use. Um, and they also gathered monthly trip data from us um, and incident reporting as well um, in order to understand the, the picture on a, on a national level. Um, as I said, the DFT are keen for us to um, undertake the extension and to share the lessons, but we're not obliged to do so. Um, some local authorities may also require um, different um, contracts or, or different operators, um, which may come under the vehicle special operator special order um, and and that might necessitate new vehicles coming in, different models, updates of models that um, 
providers are, are wanting to introduce so that would come under that bracket as well um we don't believe speaking to our legal team we don't believe we've got any particular issues in terms of procurement um we're satisfied that we've got a, a provider in place and um, we don't need to re-procure that um so if we did want to go ahead with the continuation it should be quite a, a smooth process in in the procurement sense um and the uh experimental order has been made um, permanent um, on the basis that it can be withdrawn when the trial ends. So that's how it stands at the moment. In addition, and, and probably as a result of this, Ginger are looking to extend the fleet that they operate in Chester um, and the number of bays that they operate in Chester. So currently there's 172 scooters in the fleet and there's 49 um, geofence locations where the vehicles are parked um, once they've been um, right has been finished i think the license the vehicle special order um, allows up to 400 ve 450 vehicles in the fleet for chester so we're introducing them on an incremental basis looking at the data making sure that we're not sort of you know overloading the city with um, scooters and making sure that we just take that incremental approach to their introduction um, but as i say ginger are looking at new sites and so if there's any um, locations where you want us to consider um, I say drop an email to myself or the transport strategy inbox as well and, and we can um, take an assessment with with uh, Ginger on site to look at those locations. Um, they do provide a monthly update for us. I'm not sure I can share it sort of more more widely th than this really, but this gives a bit of a snapshot in terms of where the um, most popular locations are for hiring. Um, you might not be able to see this on screen, but it's the circle obviously dictates how 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 much or how how well used the vehicles are um but the orange and there's a slight sort of pie shape like a trivial pursuit kind of slice out of some of them the orange bit um is the sort of point to point journey so you might say it's utility or a leisure journey and the smaller sort of trivial pursuit size slice that i'm talking about or the yellow bit is um ones that might be circular so it might be in like a novelty value so we can see from this that the, there are specific uh, locations where the scooters are particularly well used but equally they may be used for a utility purpose whether it is you know leisure getting to a job or, or to the rail station and things like that um, there does seem to be a purpose to the journeys rather than say just you know an experiment really so that's quite encouraging um, the other thing that um, we said last time was the bus service improvement plan received a nil settlement from DFT um, that hasn't changed, um, but we we did get some feedback from DFT um, and, and I've put it on a slide here for you. Um, they, they told us that, you know, the majority of our information requested support, um, requested in the supporting guidance we provided um, and it was mainly detailed and clearly presented, um, although they did query the timelines that we were projecting our targets for. So they wanted targets up to 2030. Um, not we haven't responded back to them because it would be a bit tip for tap but in terms of you know letting you know what, what where we're coming from um you know the nature of the bus sector at the time our prime concern was to get the um bus into recovery mode um and so we were quite keen that we'd set intermittent it or i suppose intermittent or, or smaller scale targets so that we could really measure that um, improvement that we'd make um with the focus being on recovery in the first instance the other thing they said is we did set a strong baseline evidence report and we were particularly pleased with that, um, but they felt that further evidence of engagement with key stakeholders such as bus operators and local community would have strengthened our BSIP. Um, again, our response to that is, you know, we had fortnightly meetings with the um, working group, which is now established um, and, and happens on a equally on a fortnightly basis but we brought the operators along us with every step of the journey really so they were fully engaged in the process um, so we did have a very open and transparent relationship with the bus operators in Cheshire West and Chester they were invited to all the meetings they were um, integral in developing the bus service improvement plan um, and we also did um, obviously we're still under COVID restrictions we had specific timelines from DFT the BCIP had to be supplied or submitted by the 31st, 31st, 31st of October apologies um, and we also had to get cabinet approval to to submit it so you know the lead-in periods for establishing the the BSIP and, and doing consultation were quite limited, but we were able to go out to members of the public on an online survey, admittedly, just to ask, you know, 
what what encourages people to use public transport what doesn't encourage them to use public transport is it fares is it the state of the the um bus stop infrastructure is it the timetables a raft of kind of questions really so so we feel that we did take on board that information and put it into our uh, bus service improvement plan um, and we did get about 1650 respondents uh, on that which is really quite good i feel um so so we we do best endeavors i would say on that one um, and DFT also said they'd welcome more information on how to, on how our outputs are linked to outcomes and how the proposed measures will help to meet your targets. So a bit flippant there in terms of it's difficult to, to say that in the absence of any funding, but this is something that we will definitely progress through the enhanced partnership working groups, the forum and the board as well, so that we can fully make sure that anything we are delivering has is specific to the outcomes that we, we set out in the BSIP. Um, and then can we just can we just pause there because um, you've done two quite significant items there and we've got a couple of hands up. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't see hands. No, no, I should have said that, that's okay. I didn't want to interrupt your flow, but I thought if we could just pause just to talk about e-scooters and BSIP. Okay, and of course. I think Vanessa's hand went up when we talked about uh, e-scooters. So do you want to come in now, Vanessa? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Karen. Just really to follow along on on, on the e-scooters. Um, and you know, sort of interesting with the dates and when the trial is going to finish. But it wasn't there some discussion uh, I've heard from somebody about e-bikes being introduced because obviously that's sort of a. Uh, I think the e-scooters are great, particularly if you're wearing a frock. Um, but uh, but yeah, e-bikes would be great as well. So is is there an update on that at all, Christy? Um, I think the um the the correspondence from DFT allows that to come into play, so we can broaden our um, offer out to cycle hire. Uh, I think one of the things that we want to make sure that we do is that we introduce it um, in the right areas. I think, you know, as you say, cycle hire and e-scooters, e-cycle hire, sorry, you know, there's, there's a market there as well for people who maybe don't want to cycle as far as, um, well, who would maybe struggle to to, uh, to cycle long distances or, or, you know, any uphill those kind of things um so we are looking at that i haven't got any further updates on that at the moment other than ginger are quite keen to introduce that we haven't progressed that any further um but that's that's definitely that we see definitely something that we see as part of the public trans well the transport offer as a sort of modal hub in terms of you know interchange at rail or bus bus stations etc so i think i'll probably say watch this space and we'll come back to you with an update on that if that's okay I yeah, know it was quite interesting when we did the uh, workshops for AppFest that the sort of the concept of having e-bikes was quite attractive to the youth audience as yeah. well as the e-scooters. E so, uh, yeah, great. Thanks, Chrissy. Yeah, OK, thanks, Vanessa. Um, Stephen Perry. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Vanessa. Thanks, Christy. Yeah, I was actually going to ask exactly the same question of Vanessa, which was great. Uh, and thanks for your feedback. Just on, on a point of e-scooters. Do I understand from your presentation that the likelihood is that privately owned e-scooters will in some way in the future be legalised and controlled so people can use their own scooters on you know, highways or, or um, cycle paths? Is, is that what, what you're saying? Um, I'm not sure I am saying that, to be yeah. honest. I think that will be, <laughs> those will be the words from the DFT, but what, what they did say in their last um, correspondence is that private e-scooters remain illegal to use on the public highway so yeah. that's kind of a statement for now okay. um they dft do want us to do more sort of um work with our e-scooter provider and with the police in terms of you know curbing irresponsible behavior of, of, of um, well not all are responsible if there's irresponsible behavior of private um, e-scooter owners um, so they do want us to do more on that um, I think there will be a likelihood that under that new um, low emission low speed vehicle um, acronym that I keep forgetting I think there's a, a possibility that e-scooters will be legalized in some form but I think what the they're looking to get from us as trials is in terms of you know whether there's um, something to do with the speed of the vehicles the classification of the vehicles as well so it doesn't mean that all e-scooters now will be made legal on okay. on on ratification by a dft i think there'll still be some parameters around it um but i, I would be lying if i said i knew the answer okay well thank you sorry no go on Stephen. it's okay i was just going to add something to what um christy said as i understand it, it DFT are considering 
whether they make these private scooters uh, OK to use on the highway. And um, just to add, I have what you just mentioned there about enforcement, um, that the, the, there have been some concerns raised around minor, I would say relatively minor things when you look at the data. But I did meet the Police and Crime Commissioner today to discuss how we could work more closely together, the council and the police, to try to tackle those issues. And they are they are sporadic and few and far between, but sometimes it only takes one incident to raise the profile of it and then you have a bad story when really it should be a positive story because the number of journeys that have been taken, Christy, I can't remember off the top of my head, there's over about 16,000 people subscribed and how many journeys have been made in the period of the trial? Put me on the spot. Put you on the spot. It's in the report. It's in the report. It's in my report that I wrote. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. But, uh, Karen, thank you. That was actually the very point I made because, as an active travel promoter, I get extremely frustrated and disappointed when I see cyclists in an inconsiderate way cycling on pavements, and similarly, uh, scooters doing the same illegal things. And you know, people come to me and, and moan. <laughs> so I do think we, we we do need to work at that. And I'm pleased with what you just said that we are taking it seriously. The final point to say thanks very much on the slide we now see, Christy. That's really helpful. Because out in the wilderness, people sort of know what we're applying for, and then we hear about disappointment. But actually, that's very, very helpful to have that information and share with others. So thank you for preparing it. No worries. Shall I continue? We think we've got one more hand. Okay. Sorry. Um, Tony, do you want to come in there? Yeah, yes. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor. Um, Christy, I, I was really excited to see the progress that's being made on a number of trips. Uh, but I just want to pick up on one thing that I think we discussed probably two meetings ago, and maybe in the context of what was said before about minuting things in terms of actions, it was an area of, of concern to do with um, the ginger scooters. And if you remember, we were all massively enthusiastic about their use, but worried about their speed, particularly in uh, highly pedestrianised areas. And I think when we talked about it, uh, there was a facility that they have from a GPS standpoint to limit the speed when you're in densely, you know, pedestrianised areas. And I don't know whether you've had a chance to talk that with the operators, but I think it would be something that if you could regulate it, it would massively improve the acceptance amongst the non-scooter using public, but for whom they have to share the space with. And then the second thing is, um, I've noticed quite a lot of um, scooter usage with two people on them. And I also worry about whether or not, you know, that could, I want it to be a positive using these scooters and any negative that prevents their further expansion, I'm almost willing to try and clip through technology. And I just keep wondering whether, is there a load cell on these scooters that would almost like prevent it from moving off if it had more than a certain mass on it. Um, I, I just think these things, I'm really keen to expand both scooter usage and e-bike usage and anything gets in the way of that. I almost would think it would be very good to open a conversation with the, with, 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 with the operators. Um, because I, I think unbridled use of purchase scooters that don't have any of these um, elements attached to them worries me like hell because where you've got a regulated regime, safety can be controlled. When you've got an unregulated regime, you know, it, it, it could be Fred Carno Circus out there um, if you're not careful and, and put a bad spin on what is a fabulous trial that is, I think, going from strength to strength. Thanks, Tony. Anyway, sorry for being a bit verbose there, but you get the feeling. No, no you're right. Um, we agree. And um, Christy, I think um, we were just discussing that today with the police that in some of the in the yellow zones, the maximum speed is now limited to 3.7 mile per hour. Yep. The maximum speed of the scooters is 12 mile per hour, where yep. the, tri the trial set it at 15, I think it was. Yep. So yep. We, we went for the lower speed. But you're right in what you say about two people using them and I think my understanding is conversations happening with the with Ginger with the operator to see what we can yeah. do about that that I have to say they've been very responsive every time oh, yeah. she has been yeah. raised yeah I mean so. I, I really the more and more I hear about people using they're almost becoming this point to point thing 
is becoming yeah. a really common usage. In other words, people are getting into a habit of just using it all the time as their mode of transport within the city. And I think it's a great, great, great initiative. And I, I would love to see e-bikes. So I don't need to take my car to go to the supermarkets down on Sealand Road. The moment you get me one of those, I'll be as happy as Larry. All right. I don't have anything particular to add from what you've said, yeah. Councillor Shaw, in terms of your speed and everything. That's that's entirely accurate. We will we'll take up um, conversations with Ginger. I'm not sure about there's a there's a measurement on load because, um, you know, people are different weights and things like that. So I don't know whether, but I'll certainly investigate that with okay. them. Um, and then see. just to say that um, there is certain areas of the city that they are precluded from going in and they will grind down to a halt. So I'm wondering whether I share the map of the operational zone and then if people have areas of concerns, that might be something we need to revisit or, yeah. or to look at yeah. um, because it should all be quite well controlled in terms of where they are allowed and where they aren't allowed. So yeah. I'm assuming they are ginger scooters on the basis that you're flagging it with us as well, rather than private, private as well. But we need to draw that information out as well, really. So Yeah, um, but the less of it, Christy, is, is a fabulous uh, initiative. I think it's going from strength to strength. And my comments are only about trying to remove any residual negative that the public might perceive as being associated with them to allow it to expand even further. Yeah. Yeah. No, fully appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Um, Christy, just before you move on from BSIP, there's just one comment I wanted to add just so that the task force are aware. Following that quite disappointing news that we weren't getting any funding, the leader of the council um had a meeting with Baroness Veer, who for those of you who don't know is the the government's bus sort of bus girl she's kind of the person who is heading up this this thing and um she it was a really really positive meeting to the extent in fact that they've got officials coming over the summer to come and view what we are doing um and I think you know to be to, to to be entirely honest, um, there wasn't enough funding to go around for everybody, but she is still committed and hopeful that there will be further rounds of funding available so that we can use the good work that's been done to build on that. So um, we, we we keep pushing and I want to reassure you that we keep pushing and we, we're look, reaching out to, to, to work with people and try, show them what we're made of, really, to try and get the best that we can for the residents of the borough. So we'll watch this space and we will let you know how those how those visits go. Um, and if anything's going to come out of it. Christy, uh, if you if I can hand back to you now, you could make Thank some... Thank you. Um, just Sorry. shout out if there's any more hands, um, because I really can't see, so apologies on that front for everybody. Um, the final point that was raised from DFT was about the B BSIP being able be better strengthened with more discussion about integration of buses with other modes, um, rail, walking and cycling. Um, and I think, you know, as Council Shaw's just said, we were quite, we were cognizant of that at the time. So again, it's a little bit of a, a disappointment that that wasn't recognised in our in our um, attempts to, to put together a coordinated and, and well uh, thought out document. So again, it's something that we'll explore through the Enhanced Partnership Working Group Forum and Board. Um, so, I think I touched upon what those were last time, um, but the working group is officers and and the operators. The forum is a bit more of a wider group, um, interested parties, um, which I'll come to on the next slide. Uh, but we had our first meeting at the beginning of July and we've also had our first meeting of the Enhanced Partnership Board, which is the sort of decision making body, if you like, of, of the Enhanced Partnership. So um, we're out the gates and we're starting to, to put this into practice, which is really um, good, I feel. Um, so, as I said, the operator groups, uh, operating officers, they're, they're meeting fortnightly. They're setting our sort of work programme. Um, we've had our in enhanced partnership forum, which some people around the table were at. Um, and we've um, so we've got members from the university, from um, the hospital, Marketing Cheshire, the LEP, um, Transport Focus, um, neighbouring authorities, including Welsh authorities as well. So we've got that cross party because people don't recognise borders uh, when they're travelling public transport and nor should they be concerned with them really. Um, so we've got a, a, a group going forward of, of the forum, but we're always keen to hear from more people. So I think we've got a bit of a challenge out at the moment to get um, bid representation across the borough and Chamber of Commerce as well. Um, so we've got a bit of an action on some of our staff to, to do that at the moment so um that's what we're focusing on um the enhanced partnership board as say we met yesterday and that considered 
consists of two larger operators, which in this case are Stagecoach and Arriva. Um, and because we've got us, uh, we've got about three small, smaller operators in the borough. There was a a, a, a meeting whereby they decided who would represent, because um, there's voting rights attached to the board. If if there's any sort of decision making that may may or not be controversial going forward, so the two smaller operators who are representing the borough are Aintree Coach Line and D and G um, buses, and then myself and Rose attended as well. Um, we are still awaiting information on funding. We, we were promised a free year um, enhanced partnership person post um, from government. Um, I think summer re recess starts on Thursday, so we might not hear about that until, um, well, for a couple of weeks or months, I guess. So um, we're still waiting on that information. Um, in terms of, um, you know, the nil settlement, you know, we have to deliver something with nothing at this point in time. Um, so we're trying to get the message out that the enhanced partnership is established at least and we've worked really hard with our bus operators um, they've done promotion on armed forces day for both armed force serving armed forces and veterans as well to do sort of uh, promotions on public transport during that week and weekend that they could have free uh, travel um, and also we've we've worked with them on re um, public transport offers for resettling ukrainians as well so they've been really really supportive of that work we have had to do a network review for DFT, which I think I touched upon last time. And this is looking at what the bus network will look like post October when the government's funding is due to end. Um, so there may be some changes in terms of, you know, services may be tweaked. Um, you know, some evening services may be reduced because of the, the cost and, and the falling patronage, patronage numbers. So we really need to do things now to try and address that and get people back onto to public transport. One of the things we have noticed is that concessionaires um, aren't coming back in the same numbers. Um, so the board said yesterday that we could um, seek to um, promote free travel for concessionaires pre 9.30 uh, during school holidays. So maybe the, the fact that, you know, overcrowded buses in the morning peaks might have been putting them off um, traveling. So we're going to put an offer out there during the school holidays, see if that makes a difference. Anything we're doing, we're going to monitor and we're going to make sure that it makes a difference and, and we're able to, to see if there's, if there's a positive result at the end of it. The other thing that the board wanted us to look at was a marketing campaign to get people back to bus, to understand why people aren't traveling on bus as well. Um, the council has a capital programme as well in terms of bus stop improvements so that it could be raised curbs so that they're accessible for everyone to get on. It could be the bus shelters um, need a lick of paint and things like that. So um, we've got a programme of bus stop improvements that we're, we're taking through the working group and working with the operators that, you know, what routes they're on and, and the prioritisation of that. But equally, we get um, requests from members of the public as well. We would take to the working group to, to assess. And then the other areas we need to look at is bus passenger charter. Um, so, you know, the standard provision that you'll expect from a bus operator and from the council in terms of travelling in our borough by bus um, and ticketing as well. So we, we are a bit behind on ticketing. We have a stored value card um, and we haven't, you know, got those kind of operator, you know, weekly passes and monthly passes that other maybe other local authorities that you might see in the city region have. Um, so we need to do some work in terms of what we can do to, to make the ticketing provision better. Um, obviously, if we had some funding, we wanted to do initiatives for um, young people as well to make sure that they were um, not precluded from jobs and uh, education, et cetera, things like that. Um, apologies, I'm, I am going on a bit. Um, so the other thing I just wanted to update you on was the Rural Mobility Fund. So um, I'll just quickly go to the next slide so you can see the area that it was covering. Um, so we put in a bid to DFT for a rural or demand responsive transport scheme within this sort of red line area. We're hoping to connect to rail stations um, and connecting people to jobs and employment, but equally doing leisure trips and things like that um, for the community as well um, as, a, as a bolt on to public transport, I would say. Um, so at the moment, um, we we were looking at the area, as you've seen on the map, which includes Kingsley, Crowton, Axtonbridge, Norley, Delamere, Manley, Moldsworth, um, Albany, Habsford, Ince and Elton. Um, and we were looking at the opportunities to introduce this demand responsive transport uh, within that area to improve air quality and to make those links with public transport. Um, it was a three year trial and we received over a million pounds from DFT to do that. Um, we have taken our time in terms of establishing with certain user groups and, and different ward and parish councillors to understand what the, the uses of that 
facility would be um, and we have done some procurement exercises which I can't tell you the outcomes of that at the moment because some of them are still live um, so that relates to vehicles service and delivery but also the back office system for the apps in order to book the service sorry council sure have you um got something or as it i didn't know if you were um popped up as as to say something or not but if not i will just continue um so the back office app um we are looking at and um, we also need to do some work in terms of the the branding of the vehicle um and an eye-catching design and livery for it um but we want a flexible service that um meets the community the community's needs um young people and old and and, and anyone in between um and, and allows them accessible um, journeys to healthcare, shopping, as well as you know more utility purposes as well. Okay. Um, so, in terms of active travel, um, not a massive update for you today. So you're absolutely be glad to hear, but that's maybe just my voice. You want me to stop? Um, but in terms of the active travel social prescribing, um, DFT have put the deadline back from that again till July 2022. So I don't have anything to report at this point in time, um, whether we're successful or not. But we'll let you know as soon as we do. Um, the Helsby scheme is substantially completed. I think there's a bit of resurfacing work that needs to happen, and we're working with Helsby High School. Um, and the feeder schools with Sustrans to try and do some um, workplace, well, school travel plans, some um, transition from year six to year seven on the feeder schools, incorporating um, transitions that involve bus as well, so that the safe routes to a bus stop to get to school and things like that. So we're we're catering for all kind of travel behaviours um, and to reduce congestion around the school gate, but also increase the use of our facility. Um, the next slide is in relation to working groups, which I think was on the agenda as well. So um, last time Andy Rayner came to the meeting and he gave an update on the Grosvenor Bridge. Um, so this this is me reading off a slide from the information he's provided. So I'm happy to take some questions away and, and raise them with Andy um, after the meeting. Um, but yeah, he, he suggests that um, delaying was incurred due to downloading the survey due to a backlog of, of work really on that that um, initiative, so he apologises for the delay in coming back to you. Um, got to the point where we've designed a, uh, designed a scheme um, and we're ready to share, um, but we do want to speak to the police first to make sure that they're happy with um, the, the design that we've put forward. Um, so those conversations are happening um, shortly. Um, there's some encouraging news in terms of the vehicle speeds. I think last time, or the reason the, the vehicle, the speed on the Grosvenor Bridge was amended in the first place is because the last speed information we had was quite quite high. Um, so we've looked at the um, mile per hour um, and done a comparison of the different years there. So from 2020, it, it kind of peaked and from 2021, it, it's it's decreased, but decreased again in May this year to 26.1 miles an hour. Um, so, so that's encouraging news. Um, and so it's hoped that the reduced mean speed uh, most recently recorded um, will allow uh, potential support for 20 mile per hour over the Grosvenor Bridge. Um, so again Andy's uh, meeting with Cheshire Police to talk through this and the design um, and again um, he'll be in touch with those who, who asked to um, form a working group last time. So I think last time we mentioned that Andy had asked to register interest in the working group which I think you all have but I just put on the bottom of that slide just to to uh, reiterate that. And my final slide um, again relates to, to working group that we discussed uh, last time was the park and ride. So we've done a bit of a soft market testing um, to understand what operators um, thoughts on the on the park and ride service would be. Um, we had three operators attend. Um, they all thought that a model on gross revenue where the council takes the risk but also takes the fair revenue would be the most appropriate ones for them. They all mentioned about um, parking charges in the city centre that might affect um, increased patronage and ridership on, on bus and park and ride, to be fair. Um, and they mentioned, you know, the lot, nothing we didn't already know, the, the leading periods for not only diesel vehicles, but obviously electric and, electric and hydrogen vehicles as well. Um, but what we do want to do um, as on the back of this and similar to Sarah, uh, Sarah's request for the TDM work, the traffic demand management work, is to ask for some volunteers for a focus group um, to look at users and non-users and, and how we can shape the um, park and ride service going forward. So I will leave it there um, and I don't know if there's any questions, but I'm happy to ask uh, answer. Sorry. 
Thanks for that really comprehensive update, Christy. And we do have a number of hands up. Um, Tony, I don't know if you wanted to come in or whether that was an, a legacy hand. You're up first. I think mine was the legacy hand. I, I do beg your pardon. I, okay, I shall no remove it. OK, thanks. Bernadette. Thank you. So it's Bernadette Bailey from uh, Cheshire and Merseyside Integrated Care Board now um, sort of representing the health service at uh, Cheshire West. Um, I'm just interested particularly Kirsty in the Rural Mobility Fund and you referenced um, access to health premises. Is somebody directly involved or have you got a link through to for that work? Um, oh, just checking I wasn't on mute. Um, yes, we have um, we have had probably stakeholder engagement with um, the parish councils and, and groups and, and probably something we need to pick up with you in terms of, of that. I know um, the Rural Mobility Fund has, has handed over the mantle in various um, guises um, and so the officer who was leading on it has changed but one of the things that they were particularly keen on is making sure we had that integration with health services so that's probably something we need to, to pick up on with you if that's okay. lovely yeah we'd like to be involved in that please and think yeah. obviously of hospitals but also gps and clinics that are perhaps in that area so um look forward to taking that forward with you thank you thanks bernadette it's lynn mckay the officer um she's taken over from jared Rhodes because jared's um well very busy on <laughs> rail stuff at the moment so that we'll put you in touch thank you thanks a lot thank you um vanessa Thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, no, uh, Craig would definitely be interested in, in getting involved with the working group for Park and Ride. Um, it's such a great way to get people into the city centre. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, it was my 15th wedding anniversary, so we decided to go to Shrewsbury for the day uh, for a change. And uh, yeah, just sort of, I started counting. I spotted the first Park and Ride. I didn't even know they had a Park and Ride in Shrewsbury and started counting them and um, before my husband and I decided that we would give it a go we had passed no less than seven park and ride signs so I think you know we can probably with a bit of signage um, and you know a few sessions of the focus groups we could we would have some pretty you know sort of early doors wins um, you know with with better signage and just marketing it better uh, I know that we did actually originally put it forward as one of the work streams that we'd like to see and be involved with um, and obviously it's going to be a bit big part of getting people into the city for uh, rap, rap fest when that happens next year um, but also it's just an ideal opportunity for people to consider other modes of transport from park and ride sites like the ginger scooters and potentially the ginger bikes so yeah thank you Thanks, Vanessa. So we'll, we'll take that as an offer then to be involved um, from Bernadette and from Craig. So Christy will make a note of that. We think we're going to discuss the groups in item item six. That's OK. Thank you. Um, Nicola. Yeah, similarly, um, I'm really keen on um, looking at things around the park and ride and what, whether we can do any pilot initiatives related to events. Um, I know it doesn't run into the evenings. I know at Christmas sometimes it's gone in. There's a later time slot. Um, we could look at things on pilot basis, things like Grove and Park Open Air Theatre. You know, include a park and ride ticket with your ticket, and there's a special bus to take everyone back at the end. You know, so it doesn't have to be going back and forth the whole way through. That would deal with parking issues that there are related to those events and you know, everybody choosing to park in Queen's Park and walk over and rather, you know, if there was a, a special kind of arrangement around events. I think that would that kind of stuff would be really interesting to look at, you know, whether it's through Shared Prosperity Fund or things like that, we could look at pilots around events and park and ride, just so that people get it into their sort of mindset that this is an option for them. And um, it also helps with ticketing for the events because um, lots of events are struggling at the moment with cost of living and um, they're not they're not necessarily going to meet their targets in terms of sales and income um, whereas so if you're looking at developing like deals and promotions that encourage people to you know here's a good way to travel you can save money on parking you know and so on it might be it might be really interesting to look at so uh, may maybe for at fest we can trial it as a spe special thing but I think for evening events it would be really good to look at bespoke 
programme. Thanks, Nicola. That, that's great. And I, I think we, we, we tried similar things with, um, we partnered up in the past with um, some of the stores. Um, even the race course, I think. But you're right. Um, if we could try, if we could perhaps use perhaps AT Fest as a as a a trial, that would probably be really good. There's loads of things that we could do, and and it's interesting to note as well that parking's come up as um from the operators as being a thing that they think holds back the use of park and ride because people, you know, despite what a lot of people say, parking is relatively cheap given that it's a city. So. Or even a trial with Story House from tomorrow. Yeah, that's that's a good suggestion as well. I think a definite evening trial would be good to look at. So as a, as you know, so if we can get a bit of funding to support, like putting on a bus just to see what the take up is, you know. So yeah. Okay. Sorry, my child was jumping in and he's got no clothes on because it's too hot. So <laughs> just kind of stop him from revealing himself to the meeting. <laughs> um, if I could just bob in there before um, Mike asks his question. Sorry, it's just um, one of the elements of the soft market testing was to sort of ask about integration with the local bus network and nighttime economy. Um, so we did have a bus service review task group um, about a year ago now across party uh, one of the things they wanted us to do on park and ride is to investigate you know how park and ride could support the nighttime economy. Could it integrate with local transport? Um, I think what has just been said a great ideas um the operators were really keen that you know they the park and ride operators should say was or potential park and ride operators they were supportive of events like christmas and the supporting the christmas markets but what they did say is that you know it's it's a different market for some nighttime activities um and they didn't want to detract from the local you know if their local bus network would do the same job we need to think a bit more cleverly about how we support the local bus network and let and uh, from a council's perspective an extended park and ride into the evening if people aren't using it, it costs us more money as well potentially depending on what model we take so i think the call from the local bus operators would be that we investigate local bus as the prior as the prior as the first point of call if i can put it that way but i don't think it precludes anything that you've said i think we just need to you know look around it and work around it i think they need to look at consumer demand to make a decision on stuff on things like that because I think you've got to look at the where they're coming from as well yeah. as the yeah. um Definitely. you know what the bus operators want. And yeah. I I totally support the idea of like encouraging local bus usage. But I think you know in making someone make the transition from car to bus, car to park and ride is less of a jump for them, you know, because of that door to door delivery. Um, so, you know, if we can try and do it in step changes, I don't know. It, I just um, we probably want to do both, but I just think it's worth considering consumer side as well as the, the operator yeah. demand. Yeah, thanks, Nicola. Qu quite agree. Thank you. Um, can I bring Mike in? Mike yeah. uh, thanks. Um, I just want to endorse what Nicola just said, really, and just throw in the issue of uh, Parking around the city centre, you, you reference Nicola Queen's Park, parking around Queen's Park to, to walk over to Grosvenor Park. Well, I think there's an issue about residence parking and, and conflicting with people looking for free parking around the city centre or edge of city centre, which Park and Ride could address as well. So I think there's a whole bunch of things here which could be rolled into a strategy. Um, because I don't know that's an issue. Just a, a, another passing thought. Um, come next September, we're going to be next to an area which imposes a 20 mile an hour speed limit on um, urban residential roads, i.e. Wales. Uh, so when that is introduced, might we also think about a similar approach for Chester? Uh, Mike, we have you know about our twenty mile per hour schemes, don't you? I we know, have. I know. <laughs> yeah, we, we 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 definitely. I mean, I've said this to people that have contacted me about it. I think we definitely do need to think about our next step, next steps on that um, about going even further. But obviously, it's one of those issues that can be controversial. So we need to we need to we need to do it carefully. I think is what I'll, is all I'll say. Yeah, I think we need to make the case 
this yeah. is a small town. It's um, it's only two kilometers from the ring road to the middle of town. It can't possibly add more than one minute to travel times. <laughs> it, yeah. And so, but the Welsh bit is is kind of going to make it really quite interesting. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Nicola, do you want to come back in? I'm really sorry, but I'm on a bit of a like a, a roll now. So, um, said the other thing that we we were talking about in relation to events, and Mike's just prompted me on it is, you know, is there a like a play? Is there a way we can like buy temporary cycle storage so that you know when you go into an event that the event organizer can have it as racking? We thought we'd trial it for Atfest, but like. You know, Grosvenor Park would be a prime example of where some people could cycle to, but and their bikes could be kept in the secure kind of area of the park, sort of the Grosvenor Park theatre. And, you know, but there isn't any place to securely rack your bike near the park. So people aren't going to cycle. You could have an arrangement with the indoor market to like deliver your picnic on site. So there, there could be some really innovative ways that you could work on things that just help people to think yeah actually that is something I would consider doing and I just think it's just constantly going back to like you know making taking away those barriers I know that's something you know but just as a bit of a other idea to kind of just put in there um I know that's not bus and I'm sorry Chris, Christy but <laughs> I had to say it just there and then whilst I was on my events roll. Thanks Nicola no I think that's great we agree um there's a, there's a the capital program. Um, the council has a capital program. I won't go into detail now, but it renews in 2024. So all of these things are, um, as well as the outside funding opportunities available, we also have the internal funding opportunities, and all of these things are being thought about now. I think is fair to say. But there is also the climate emergency response fund, um, and I think I know they're doing a lot of work to try and to try and deliver that too. I'm just I'm just conscious of the time because we have gone over a little bit and I was really needing to try and get away on time today. So if we could just bring Vanessa and John in and then we'll have to move on, I'm afraid. Vanessa. Yeah, just, just a quick one from me, just following on directly from what Nicola said about sort of bike storage. I mean, what Patch have done really successfully with their with their sort of art exhibitions in empty retail units. And I noticed it when I was last in London is that people who say have ex expensive bikes that cost a couple of thousand pounds they don't necessarily want to put them in bike storage on the street but you can get the ones that sort of are literally sort of on the wall um with a sort of almost like a sort of um a concierge service so if we could use some of the empty retail units for that during ac fest as well that would be brilliant that's it i'm done thank you okay thank you um John yes yeah, just building on what Nicholas said about the um possible bike uh, facilities in uh, Grosvenor Park that in a way also was considered um last year when we we're looking at the emergency active travel lanes that um you know it's all right you know if we, if we were to get the two-way cycle lane down there they've got to have somewhere to put the bikes when they get into Chester and we thought it would be quite a, a good route to take them on that small section of the inner ring road to Grosvenor Park and then have like a, an, like a big bike storage area. And then from there, you just walk into town. Yes, um, I'm just writing down this down, but I, I, I know that, I mean, there are. There are plans being progressed is what I'll say, but I obviously I'll pick this up with other colleagues in the council and, and we perhaps need to come back, Christy, at a later point, I think, and with an update on where we're at with that. That would that be helpful, John? Yes, by all means, yes. OK. Um, OK, thanks, everybody. And thanks, Christy, for your update. Um, we're going to move on to to the Active Travel Fest proposal update now. And Vanessa and Stephen are going to lead on that. So over to you. Thank you. Uh, Sharon, could you throw up the presentation now i'm going to do my best to do this quickly without rushing it because <laughs> obviously uh everybody should have had a copy of this in advance that was intended to make it a little bit easier um but uh i'm giving the presentation um my colleagues may want to chip in when i'm speaking and questions at the end um but just to emphasize i'm the speaker here but there's been a massive input from um clearly 
Nicola, who, uh, who was part of this main team from the beginning, Vanessa, also part of the team, but also more recently and equally committed, Steve Densley um, and uh, Martin Preston. So thanks to all of them. If we take the first page, please. Right, um, just a reminder, what I'm just to remind you, what's this all about? Uh, and in the first two or three slides, that's why what I'm going to be talking about. What is it we're trying to do? And then we'll go fairly quickly through slides to talk about how we're going to do it. I'm not going to read every line there, but it's basically we want it to be a fun event. We want to drag people, encourage them to into the city centre, particularly encouraging those that have relatively short distances into the city centre who would not normally think of walking or cycling or wheeling. Uh, we want to work through existing community groups to try to encourage. That's the push to sort of encourage people to come in and make that process of coming into town part of the fun as well. We will highlight and demonstrate uh, routes they can use. We won't guide them as such, but we will give them clear directions on how to get in. Well, through that process, and really importantly, we want to understand as of today, really, and as we move forward, what are the barriers? What makes active travel a less attractive option for many people? And that question about evaluation comes through in several uh, of the slides I'm going to use. Uh, we need to be able to go back at the end and say what's changed and, and quite honestly this is all focused on helping the local authority to meet its active travel targets and by the way I come back to this as well we want the city centre businesses to feel a benefit from what we're doing. Uh, next slide please. So I've talked about the pull we have lots of ideas of what we might use, use to attract people there's a few old photographs I found from my uh, files of events we held in 2010, I think. We want events that attract people. That could be, it would include a number of people. It would include retailers that are associated with cycling and wheeling, whether they sell bikes, maintain bikes, rent bikes or scooters or whatever. It'll also be very much focused on encouraging local independent re retailers to be engaged, to have alfresco, uh, re uh, alfresco um, hospitality offerings and uh, stores and things op op in the open air. The exact locations will be decided, but uh, we'll work around what's available. We also um, want to have things which are fun to watch, uh, stunt cycling or kids cycle areas or areas where people can trial scooters or e-bikes or both. And we also want to engage with other partners that have a part to play whether it's Sustrans or the Canal and River Trust or the health and safety, the health and uh, welfare sector, the police, storyhouse, etc. So we've got a long list of things that we think we might can do to attract people. And on the next slide, you'll see some thoughts on how we might encourage people coming in. There's a, a suggestion of four hubs there, a Blaken, uh, the sort of Limefields area, probably at the bottom of the Duke's Drive and probably the Westminster Park area. They could be different, they could be additional. But we'll encourage people from communities that naturally feed into these hubs to come along there, to group, to maybe have a bit of fun there, an ice cream store or a cup of coffee, and to travel in in a sort of phased and controlled way into the city centre by whatever means they want and by whatever speed they want. So the, uh, the groups will be encouraged not on the morning, they'll be encouraged two or three months before the event. So we'll have other things that might be bikeability training for people. It might be cycle buddy, it might be family rides, but we want the event to be the crescendo, not just something that lands on a Sunday morning. We want it to be the crescendo for a number of other activities. Next slide, please. So what's happened since the last ISTT meeting? We've had two really successful workshops with interested members of the ISTT and a few other local councillors. We've had really constructive conversations with uh, potential sources of support in general and have been in liaison with the Green Expo team. We've now got a pretty solid base of people who are interested and willing to give support. And in the following slides, you'll see an outline forward plan of how initially we're talking about it in two slices as a sort of project management phase where we've got no money, we've just got enthusiasm. <laughs> And I've offered the service of sort of managing this process until the point at which we have money and we can event, we can appoint an event manager who can then take it forward. And that event management role will be um, provided by a person we, we know but haven't yet commissioned because we haven't got the money. Uh, but that, uh, that role of the event manager we managed uh, by Active Cheshire, which is great because if you remember the last uh, discussion we had, 
neither Crag nor the Chester Cycling Campaign had the, the structures to take on that commitment. Active Cheshire can, and they've been wonderful in taking that initiative to work alongside us. So that's great news. Next slide, please. Just a list of who's been involved. Um, as I say, two really good meetings, lots of good ideas. You can see some names there um, and a, a fairly wide breadth of people willing to come along and give their ideas. On the next slide, please. What came out of these discussions? Again, there's an overlap in these things, but you know, talking to the young people from the Youth Senate or some of the older people, <laughs> we want this thing to be fun, cool, edgy, whatever word you want to use. As a real emphasis, it must appeal to the Chester business community. They must end the day saying that was really good. Let's do it again. Um, although we're calling it an event, we've been quite rigorous in trying to define exactly what is our project definition. What is the real, who's going to sponsor this? And you'll see later on we've got a sponsor nominated. What's the scope, geographical scope, the scope of people we're trying to attract, the objectives, the liberals, etc. So there's a real strong message we're going to manage it like a project because as the, set, as the next bullet point says if we want to attract funding especially from see, you know, serious sponsors we've got to demonstrate the fact we can monitor evaluate and learn from the experience it's a one-off event at the state at the moment but we hope it to be an example for other events maybe again in chester or maybe in other parts of the of the borough it's about changing attitudes it's not about infrastructure but clearly our marketing and communication strategy will be key. And in the short term, that's where we've got to find the money in the short term. We need to get a website up, up and running and we need to have some sort of compelling at first promotional brochure, if you like, to take to potential sponsors. Um, we want to make sure that people people are talking about this. As I say, this the build up is as important as the event itself. And as I've already indicated, getting there should be fun as well. And let's, you know, there's a big catchment area out there, not necessarily 15, 1, 1,500 people living within one or two miles, but there's a, there's, a, there's a resident group we should be bold in terms of trying to attract them. Next slide, please. So again, to summarise something I said already, uh, we're being driven partly by the timing of a space hive application for funding. Uh, we see this as the predominant, but not the only source of funding. There's no guarantee, of course, but we're driving ourselves toward what we call an event definition deliverable sometime end of October, beginning of November, where we say this is what we're going to do and we can pretty well cost what that's going to cost to put up. It might be a sort of at fest light based on the money we get or the money we hope to get and it's something we could perhaps build on. But up to that point, the team is driving to make that event as defined as possible. And then there's a process which we need to go through to hopefully get the money all to be all to be agreed. So hopefully by the beginning of January, we'll have a reassurance we've got the funding and it does provide a bit of a sort of not hiccup, but food for thought as to how we get to that point that we haven't got funding. So we do need some seed cord funding. And if you look at the next slide, that's just emphasised. Yeah, the crowdfunding, any funding we can generate from now onwards can be set aside against the um, the quack element of the potential funding from space cyber. I won't go into the details of space cyber is a crowdfunding, a crowdfunding concept, but we have to provide 25% of whatever we target uh, and through local authority funds managed by space cyber, there's a 75% offering from them and the maximum we could get from that as a total amount is £25,000. But clearly, as I've already said, we've got to find a little bit of money in the short term. Uh, next slide, please. So, not very interesting, but it does represent a checklist of the things we're thinking about and the way we're structuring ourselves. So I won't read all the words, but clearly, and the words aren't complete and they may not be accurate, but there are six subgroups there that each have a part to deliver. Marketing promotion the event, and as I say, really a focus on website and sponsorship prospectus and other things that may follow. Initial funding to get ourselves up and running. The design of what we call the pull event. That's that's the real meat in the sandwich, really. Um, what sort of things will we actually want to have? The things I mentioned in the city centre to attract people. The push initiative, where we'll work through. I've used the word motivators. That's not necessarily the best word. They're not going to be guides. They're not going to you know, lead people in, but they're going to motivate people in the local community to come together. And they could be natural groups of school children, 
college or university, community groups, church, businesses, people who who naturally are a group and are willing to be cajoled and encouraged. And they may not may not have ridden a bicycle for some time, so they may, not, may need a bit of help. Uh, they may need a bit of reassurance. So underneath there, there are things we might do to help them. We clearly have to tie into the local authority. Uh, we've mentioned park and ride in our conversation so far. That's left us a question because I think we still need to engage with the, the local authority team to work about how that comes into a, our portfolio of, uh, of things to, uh, to be handled. But we'll come back to that when we have to. And research and evaluation, very much working with the, with the university to, as I say, to analyse as people, ideally as people register on the website, they'll be asked to describe to what extent they use active travel, what's the barriers. We can gain information which we, we can then test against a, a, a post event result. And just the next slide, please. It just shows some, some names that have come forward. Uh, Rose MacArthur has kindly agreed to our project sponsor. I'm happy to try to steer the ship for the next two or three months. Steve's got two roles. He's happy to be our uh, finance man, but also our initial fund gatherer. Nicola's sitting in marketing promotion. To be confirmed when we have some money, uh, somebody in the pull box. I'm also happy to take the push initiative. Uh, we need to talk with Christy and Jane about developing the, the uh, local authority liaison. And Martin, with support from Tamara Hunt from the university, is taking on the right hand box. So that's the sort of the how we're going to deliver it. And if we turn to the last slide, a quick summary of where we are. Hopefully, enthusiasm is coming through in what I say and how I say it. We do feel we now have the support to make this event happen. We've had a few <laughs> false starts and ups and downs, but I think we've got there. And most importantly, we've decided to hold the event on Sunday, the 18th of June, in collaboration with the Green Expo team. And that's their target date, the, 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 the three days running up to that Sunday, or I should say the Friday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, is their target date, yet to be formally uh, agreed by the uh, Green Expo board, but nonetheless, that's the intent. So in the meantime, we do need to sit down with Rose and make sure we've got the same scope, objectives and deliverables as she feels is appropriate. We need to get that event management role in place and funded. We need to have a clearer understanding. I think it's quite clear about the space hiving funding round and actually the impact it might come through PERDA next year because between over a period of about six or eight weeks, is it? You know, we have to be careful how we publicise these things if we're getting local authority money. So that there's an issue there. And finally, if you could picture those groups hanging off the the project structure you've just seen uh, by the end of August, beginning of September, we want to see fairly well defined plans from each of that subgroup of what they're going to do and what they're going to deliver. So there we are. That's where we're up to. And it's uh, I think the, the train's on the rails now. Oh, thanks, thanks Stephen. Stephen. Sorry, there Sorry. was an echo there and I couldn't uh, just quite get to the button quick enough. That that was really exciting and um, I think will be a really important event for Chester. Um, I did just have one uh question comment and i don't know whether you've explored the idea when you mentioned seed funding how much seed funding you're talking about and have you discussed it with jane making because uh, there are yeah. pots of funding that could be drawn upon i think thank you for that i mean steve may steve then you may want to comment um we had a very enthusiastic response uh from um, richard beach was saying he can he's sure he can tap on some of his council of friends to raise some let's say we're probably talking about Five thousand pounds is of that order. Okay, um, I think that's and, achievable. And if anybody can point it in the right right direction, it's the right sort of people, or particularly not not passing the buck, but but Steve has got that assignment. So yeah, anything you can do is great, Karen. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Steve, so can I just in? jump in there? Yeah, um, I've got a meeting with uh, with Richard uh, Beecham next week to discuss uh, potential funding lines. Um, there's also a couple of other options. I know some of the work that we're going to be doing around the uh, around the data and research and insight into the barriers that runs in parallel with some of the work that WSP are doing um, for the uh, technical review of the LC WIP. Um, so Rose is going to speak to them to see if there's any any possibility of collaboration there. It may not be in terms of financial. Um, 
help, but it might be um, sort of uh, sort of data insight personnel, that sort of thing that can help us with there. So I've got a, got a few hands in the fire, but uh, as Stephen said, um, if there's any other ideas out there, I'm, I'm willing to, to listen to anything. Um, but just to reiterate that the, the project we're running here has got an impact for so many different stakeholders. Uh, if you look at the work that Mott McDonald are doing around the barriers to active travel, the data we're researching will feed into that. Um, that the comment Bernadette made about um, people use how people are traveling to, to healthcare services and how they're accessing that, how they're accessing social prescribing, fits in with the, the healthcare partnerships uh, priorities and DFT priorities. So there's so many boxes we're ticking by getting this thing together. Um, it, it, it shouldn't be a problem getting people to, uh, to jump on our little bandwagon. Oh, thanks, Steve. That's really positive. Thank you. Vanessa? Just to mute myself. Uh, thanks, Karen. Yeah, it's just really sort of following on from what both both Stevens have said. Um, I mean, obviously, when this sort of idea came about, we didn't know where it was going to go. But I think, you know, so the promotional lead up to it is one third of it. Then there's the event itself. And then there's the follow up. They're all equally important because the whole idea with this and we've sort of, you know, we've, 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 we've come up with the sort of the, the tagline. So it's AT Fest. Walk walking and cycling for everyday living and that's what it's about it's about converting people to do these things on a daily basis or a regular basis rather than on a sort of novelty basis uh, and that's that that's the purpose of it really thank you hey thanks Vanessa brilliant um any other comments any questions I'm just gonna okay thanks very much Stephen and I will I will touch but oh we've got Catherine sorry Catherine no it's all right I was just gonna say really quickly because I know the time has, has gone seven but just to say that I am in conversations with uh, Rose so Living Streets is in conversations with Rose just about how we can look at those longer longer term behavior and change elements that can tie in with AT Fest so we're just looking at the the best ways to do that and um, but I think we'll have the first draft of proposals over to her um, tomorrow. So, so yeah. that is going on quietly in the background. We haven't forgotten. And Steve, I think that looks great what you put together there. Um, you really listened and taken things on board. So, yeah, fab. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Catherine. That's that's absolutely brilliant. Okay. Um, it, Christy's putting some messages in the chat. Uh, Christy, I, I, I can't. Uh, I'd have to flick through it now. Can you just? It, it, it was just an update on the the mileage of, on the scooters and the, and the dates. Sorry. So I know I said I'd get back to you, but I thought I'd put them in the chat for the minutes All to right, help so Sharon. So you can see it in the <laughs> chat. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, we just need to discuss the response um, to the list of ISTT working groups, and you've mentioned two or three of them already, which have started really, haven't they? Yeah. Did, um, and we just wanted to get another a stay really um on that so i'll hand over to you for that if that's okay yeah, that's fine i think it will be quite short um <laughs> in terms of um the the update but we've we've got the ask from andy rayner in terms of the chester grosvenor bridge so that ask is out there so if anybody wants to get involved um i think that's still available um and i'm happy to be a conduit to andy if that's the case at fest is obviously uh you know taking shape and, and uh, developing well so that's brilliant news and um, the two other things that were on the list um or, or mentioned last time were bus and park and ride um obviously that's an initiative that the council needs to explore more fully and we need to look at those um alternatives and, and options that nicola and others have mentioned as well for the park and ride um but the at the immediate point in time i think the ask from the group is, you know, representatives of the working group for a focus group. And I think a few people put their heads up and hands up for that one. So that's really appreciated. But anyone else who wants to um, get involved, please um, send me an email. Um, the other option that we we talked about, which isn't quite as, as ready, um, but may have more information to impart at the next meeting or even maybe get in touch with you prior to the next meeting to be involved is, is the Northwich um, Active Travel Scheme. Um, we're still in the early stages of that one. Um, but if there's any representatives from, you know, cycling groups or from um, the, that geography, then obviously we can um, work with you. But that's still quite early stages at the moment. So I think all I wanted to say is there's a call out for additional um, people uh, potentially, but we are starting to make some good progress on the working groups that we initially set out to um, to impart upon. Um, I think obviously given workloads and things like that and other people's um, 
careers and jobs and, and uh, time. I think, you know, developing it too too much and expanding it too much at this point in time is probably um, something we don't want to do. We want to keep it manageable and enjoyable for people to be involved in. So that's my only ask at this point in time, to be honest, if that's OK. Um, just to put your hands up if you want to be involved in any of those. Um, and we will. And we re reiterate Sarah Cherry's ask as well of um, mm. three or four people for the Satan um, demand, uh, Satan camp demand management study. Um, and she's looking to do those interviews fairly soon, isn't she? So if you, if, if people are interested, they can contact Christy or me. Um, Tony, I've picked up your note in the chat there. If you if you re if your email address, if you can just drop it in the chat, I'll make sure to make contact with Andy Rayner and make sure you're involved. Saved Christy a job. OK, thank you. OK, just, any, uh, any questions then? Vanessa, you've got your hand up. Sorry, legacy hand. Legacy hand, OK. Any questions then on that or any comments? Oh, Contact. actually, just a quick question. Did you pick up Christy on Andy Farrell's uh, work? I don't know if he's on the call tonight. His um, work streams. I think one of them was City Centre Living. From the last piece of work from the Sustainable Transport Task, Task Force or, or as a recommendation for a working group, sorry. I think, I think it was a recommendation for a working group, but I don't have it in front of me, so I'll, I'll dig it out and forward it to you. OK. I think, has it gone to the city board, the um, city strategic board? I'm yeah. sure it has. We'll, we'll take that away and follow okay. it up, Vanessa. Mm. OK. Um, OK. Um, any other business that anybody would like to raise at this at this juncture? Just remains for me to say thank you for joining us and for your patience on what has been a really uh, hot and stuffy evening. And it's nice to see you all. And the next meeting is going to be on Tuesday, the 13th of September. And um, I, I'd like, um, well, I may explore whether we can have a face to face or even a hybrid if I can find a, a room so that people can come and meet face to face and that's from 2 till 3 30 but for those of you who can't then you'll you hopefully will be able to join online um it seems to be going quite well now for us to do both so yeah, um great okay all right then yeah. well thanks, thanks everyone Karen. take care thanks everyone nice evening thanks, bye -bye. thanks everyone see you bye 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 good meeting Okay, that's it. Okay, Thanks, Sharon. Stop it.